Good evening, and thank you all for attending. My name is Leslie Kane, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's debate. And before we begin, just want to remind everyone to please silence all phones and electronic devices. Uh, additionally, please refrain from any interruptions to the debate as it is being recorded for on-demand viewing and post-captioning services. The Citizens Clean Elections Commission is the sponsor for this evening's event. And the Clean Elections Act is a campaign finance reform and public education measure initiated by Arizona citizens and passed by voters in 1998. The system provides clean funding for qualified participating candidates who agree to abide by the Clean Elections Act and rules. And these include contribution and spending limits, foregoing special interest money, and participating in commission debates. We do encourage audience questions, so please utilize the note card given to you when you enter the room and hold it up. And our volunteers will pick up the cards and deliver them to me. And if you need additional cards, then just raise your hand and ask. And if you have a question for a specific candidate, please make sure to include the candidate's name on the note card, and it will be considered in the second half of the debate. And we do, just so you know, screen questions for clarity and to try to eliminate duplications as much as possible, also speeches or personal attacks on candidates. And this debate tonight is scheduled for approximately 60 minutes, so we may not get to all of the audience questions, but we will do our best. This evening's debate includes one minute opening statements, and the first half of the debate begins with two minutes to each candidate to answer the same question. And then after all the candidates have responded to the question, the first responding candidate will be given an additional 30 seconds to respond or chime in. And we will rotate which candidate responds first. The second half of the debate will allow for a different question per candidate with one minute to answer and an optional 30 second comment from the other candidates. And then finally, we'll have one minute closing statements. And we ask that you remain polite to all of the candidates and give them a fair and uninterrupted hearing, no matter how strongly you may agree or disagree with anything being said tonight. Tonight's participants are Mr. J.D. Mesnard, Republican candidate for state senator, District 17, and Mr. Steve Wickert, Democratic candidate for state senator, District 17, and Ms. Jennifer Pollack, Democratic candidate for state representative, District 17. And the order in which the candidates will speak has been determined by alphabetical order, by last name starting with the Senate for opening comments, and then we'll progress from there. The order for the second half will be determined by reverse alphabetical order by last name starting with the House. So, JD, uh, that being said, will you please start the opening remarks? Thank you, absolutely. Well, I want to uh, thank the Clean Elections Commission for sponsoring this debate and for uh, each and every one of you coming out this evening. I'm looking forward to the questions ahead. I uh, also was going to express the regrets of my other two colleagues. Um, Ms. Ellen is actually on a plane flying back from visiting her daughter's uh, production. She was in a play. It was kind of a big deal, so she flew out. I did as well, but I, I came back a little sooner. Um, and Mr. Winnegar is speaking to some NCC students on blockchain technology. Uh, if you've been following him, that's big for him, and it's like a, a class that uh, was on one of his ideas. So uh, anyway, I'm very glad to be here. I've been serving in the House for eight years. I am the, currently the Speaker of the House. It's been an honor to serve, um, but I uh, am looking forward to your questions, and thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. Steve? Hi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Um, it's great to see so many people that are interested in their democracy and, and want to know more of their candidates, and I really appreciate that. I also want to thank the Arizona Clean Elections Commission. Uh, I appreciate all you do in putting all this together. Um, my name is Steve Wickard. I'm running for the State Senate, and I am, first of all, a dad. I am a dad of two daughters, and you know, when they were born, I made uh, a conscious decision and a promise to them that I would try to make this world a better place for them. And so literally for the last 10 years, I've been fighting to do just that. I've been really interested in funding our public schools and making sure that our teachers and our students have everything they need to, to have to be successful. So 
I look forward to this evening and I look forward to your questions. And again, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Jennifer? Thank you to the Citizens Clean Election Commission for hosting the debate tonight. And thank you to everybody who took time to come out on a Tuesday night. I appreciate you being here. My name is Jennifer Pollock, and I'm running for the State House here in District 17. I'm a native Arizonan. I'm married, and I have 20-year-old daughters. My mom's here tonight, too. So I appreciate that you came out to support me. I am a teacher. That is what I am at my core. From the time I was a little girl, there was nothing I wanted more than to be a teacher. I left the classroom in 2017 to run for office because of the issues that we're having with funding our schools. So I am, I am prepared to fight to make sure that our teachers have what they need to be able to provide the best education for the students that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, we will begin the portion of the debate where each candidate will have two minutes to answer the same question. And the first question is for Steve. Steve, what are the three most important issues voters would like to talk to you about when you meet with them? Uh, well, thank you for the question, by the mm -hmm. way. Uh, first and foremost, and I would have to say this is roughly at 90% of the doors that I knock on, voters are interested in education. Uh, they want to ensure that our schools are properly funded, that our teachers are properly funded, and um, so that's, that's a, one whole thing. The second issue that I hear most often is about health care. Uh, so many people within our district are complaining to me and, and telling me that their deductibles and premiums are so high right now that they are foregoing preventative health care. And as a hospital administrator myself, that's really concerning to me. That means that people are putting off preventative care, which only ends up becoming uh, more and, and bigger issues later for, for people within our community later. So very, very interested in that. Um, lastly, I think the issue of um, water has come up many, many times. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's one of our most valuable resources. And um, with the inaction at the legislature this last time around, um, there's been a lot of interest in that and um, on the environmental front. So I would say those are the, those are the three issues that I've, I've heard a lot about. Thank you. And Jennifer, same question. When I talk to voters at the doors, and I'm, I'm speaking right now mostly to independent voters, the main issue that comes up at door after door is school funding. And typically that's K-12 school funding. So people mention the size of the classrooms that their, their children are in. Um, <clears throat> the good thing here in Chandler is that the community does support bond and override elections. So here in Chandler, I'm not hearing a lot of complaints about the buildings falling down or anything like that, which is good news. A secondary issue that a lot of voters bring to our attention, like Steve said, is health care and that the cost of health care is so expensive. I've talked to young people at the doors and they said, well, right now they're on their parents' insurance, but they don't know how they'll be able to afford it once they go beyond the age of 26 and they can't be on their parents' plans anymore. And then thirdly, another issue that I've talked to a lot of young people about is the cost of college. The cost of attending university has become so great. I've talked to a number of students who have said, I can only take one or two classes at the community college because I can't afford tuition at the university. Thank you. Thank you. And. Uh, JD. Yeah, so <clears throat> pretty similar across the board. I, I suspect we're talking to a lot of the same people. Um, education and immigration actually is pretty much neck and neck uh, among the, the folks I'm talking to. Education is all over the map in terms of what f people are focusing on. So you do have the funding side of the equation um, and where we're at now, where we were, where we're going. Um, and, and actually what we just did this session uh, will put us on a path to be beyond the highest we have ever spent per pupil in education in state history adjusted for inflation, I mean, ever. 
Uh, so folks who are bringing up that we're below pre-recession levels, which is true we are, we will be beyond that uh, when this uh, 20 by 2020 plan is fully implemented over the next couple of years, which is an exciting place to be. Um, immigration, border security, ICE, um, all of that has been in the forefront of the, uh, not just Arizona conversation, but the national conversation. Um, I think there's a lot of concern that there are some folks who want to get rid of ICE or abolish ICE or prevent law enforcement from working with ICE, and that really concerns people because that affects the safety of our neighborhoods. Um, it also impacts, you know, drugs coming across the border, human smuggling, all of that. And then third, healthcare absolutely uh, is an issue. Arizona in particular was pretty uh, uh, hard hit by the uh, Affordable Care Act, which was anything but, in my opinion. Uh, there's no doubt that Obamacare in particular uh, had an impact on our premiums and the things that you're seeing, even though it was supposed to be a solution, it actually exacerbated the problem. What's interesting is that people are not talking as much about the economy, and the reason is because it's doing extremely well. Arizona's economy is booming. Of course, the U.S. economy is booming, but Arizona in particular is well positioned. Folks are talking about um, Arizona as a place to come, uh, and so we're very excited that that is not an issue that people are talking about as much at the moment. Thank you. And Steve, would you like to respond for 30 uh, yes, seconds? Yes, actually I would. Please do. Uh, first of all, on the issue of immigration, uh, I just want to go on record as saying I don't believe we should abolish ICE. Um, I do believe that we should have strong borders. Um, and a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of detractors on the other side of the aisle that say that Democrats are for open borders. I'm not for open borders. Um, I do believe in strong presence at the border from our federal government. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the other thing that I want to address is that for our education, the 20 by 20 plan, um, I just wanted to get out there. Oh, sorry. We'll continue that. Thank you. And next question. We'll start with you, Jennifer. One of our audience members would like for you to um, expand on your, uh, your opinion, state your position on Prop 305. Please do share. Absolutely. So Proposition 305, I am strongly voting no. Um, when the, the vouchers first came into existence, they were initially launched to help students with special needs whose needs were not being met in the, in the public school system. And then that money would allow them to attend a private school so that their needs could be addressed. And that makes sense to me. I, I agree with that. But what I don't agree with is the, I'm sorry, the, um, the expansion of the ESAs to what this would allow is 30,000 people. Um, I very strongly feel that we should not be using public tax money to pay for private schools nor parochial schools. I'm not against school choice, but if someone wants to choose to go to a private school, I think they are choosing to pay the tuition. Thank you. Thank you. JD. Yeah. So this is, this is a tough one. Um, Prop 305 came about because of a bill that we passed last year at the legislature, which I strongly support, and that was expanding uh, the, the what are called empowerment scholarship accounts. They're incorrectly referred to as vouchers. Vouchers are not allowed in this state. The state, constitu uh, the state constitution does not allow for vouchers. But it, there's some similar characteristics, so people call it that. Um, but it's called an empowerment scholarship account because it essentially pays for, helps to pay for tuition to private schools. What's interesting is that when we did create it, as, as Ms. Pollack correctly mentioned, it was uh, for students with special needs, uh, students in, the, in foster care and that sort of thing. The interesting uh, dynamic is that back then, it was vehemently opposed by my friends on the other side of the aisle who now support it today, or at least from what I'm hearing. And this, by the way, is a bit of a surprise um, because for a long time, the, the position was, as was mentioned, no tax payer money for private schools. But you need taxpayer money for private schools if you're going to fund special needs kids or foster kids. And so really what it comes down to is which students are you okay with uh, supporting and uh, you know, helping with tuition costs for private schools. My position is parents know best. 
I want to give them as many options as possible, which is why I supported the bill last year. They do pay taxes, and the idea of getting some of those tax dollars uh, back in the form of helping to pay for their child's education, whether they're a special needs or foster care or the uh, child of a military student or from a, uh, a military parent or a failing school, whatever. Um, I think that the parent knows best. No politician, no bu bureaucrat knows better than a parent does what their child needs and what will meet their child's needs in, in terms of education. The challenge with Prop 305 is it will be voter protected if it passes. I generally don't like things to be voter protected because it handcuffs the legislature and makes our job more difficult. So I have mixed feelings on, on Prop 305 for that reason. I agree with the underlying policy, mixed feelings on it going to the ballot and having anything we do be voter protected. Thank you. Steve. Yeah, I, I'm a no on 305. And just like Jennifer was pointing out, I, I really truly believe that public dollars should not be flowing to our private schools. Um, and as JD mentioned, um, the Empowerment Scholarship Account uh, program that was in place, I happen to be one of those that, that was not against that program. Um, I do think that, that parents need to have a choice, and especially parents that have kids with special needs. They need to be able to have as many options available to them to, to deal with their current situation. So that being said, as, as small as that program is, I'd like to keep it small. I, I don't believe that we need to be opening it up to, it's a 30,000 cap now, but there has been a whole bunch of talk of raising that cap. Um, the Goldwater Institute was the one that came out right away and said, we are ready to, to boost that up now that we got the camel's nose under the tent. So um, I, I really do feel like we need to keep public school dollars in the public school system, especially right now. We are having an immense problem funding our schools. Um, and and I'm, I'm hoping you're correct that, that that money will be flowing back, but we haven't seen that to date. And what I'm seeing is the projections based on some very rosy revenue numbers. And until I actually see the, the actual dollars coming in, then um, I'll be a little bit more comfortable, but until then, I'm not. So I'm, I'm, I'm a hard no on, on 305. Thank you. And Jennifer, your 30-second response? Thank you. So as I said earlier, I think it's really important that public money is not going to fund private school tuition except for the case of the special, students with special needs. There are so many choices within our community. There are so many charters. There are choice programs within the public school district. I taught at a choice program within Chandler Unified, and my daughters attended a program within Chandler Unified that was a choice program. So there are many options for parents. They never have to feel like they just have to go to the neighborhood school like we did when I was a kid. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, JD, how do you feel about charter school accountability and transparency? Yeah, great question, and I'm glad that charter schools was brought up because they seem to be under attack, uh, at least in my observation, and so if that's one of the choices that parents have, there seems to be um, uh, an agenda by some who would like to see them diminished, which I think would be uh, really, really sad since some of the best schools in the entire country, in fact, five of the top 10 schools in the entire country are here in Arizona. Five of the top high schools in the entire country here in Arizona, and they happen to be charter schools. And in my opinion, we should be figuring out why they're so successful. What is making them work so well? What are they doing right? And try to replicate that rather than, than attacking them, which is, which is what seems to be happening. Uh, charter schools are, are, contract, uh, are contractors, essentially, with the state. They provide a service, and that service is education. Um, if we're going to go down the road of starting to micromanage them as contractors, we should probably open up all contractors with the state, not just uh, those who provide education, those who build roads, those who provide health care, everybody, um, because that's the, essentially what the system is now. Um, I, I do think transparency is important. That's why in the bill that I ran, uh, actually the bill that uh, implemented the 20% by 2020 teacher pay raise, that, that was my bill, we did add additional transparency requirements for charter schools. And we also added additional accountability requirements, the ability for the State Board for Charter Schools to shut a charter down for financial mismanagement, was, which was not a responsibility or power they had before. We also required them to post average teacher salaries on their website in addition to posting their budgets, which they 
they have to post now per statute. So my bill actually expanded those, uh, both transparency and accountability. I'm open to conversation about what we do beyond that. But if we're, if we're bringing up accountability and transparency really as a means of attacking charter schools, I think that's a big mistake, and that would be sad for the choice that parents have today. Thank you. Steve? So first of all, I, I just want to make it very clear, I am not attacking charter schools. I think that we have some great charter schools, just as you said. There are some really good charter schools in our district, um, but we do have some bad actors, and that's how we have had some charter schools fail at, at, at a moment's notice where parents were, were not even aware that their tr school was going to close down. And I think if we had those transparency and accountability measures in place, um, we wouldn't have gone to this level where, where we have left kids high and dry. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and so that being said, when, when I look again, and, we, and JD and I have had this conversation before, but I, Mr. Speaker, I remember that you offered an amendment during the budget process that actually relaxed the uh, accountability and transparency requirements. And um, I went back and looked after our conversation and I still feel that's, that's exactly what happened. So um, if you can explain that more, that would be great, but that's the way that, that I've seen it. Thank you. Jennifer? And I would agree with Steve on this, that with the charter schools, we definitely need more accountabil accountability and transparency. Both district schools and charter schools are funded with public money, and I realize that they're run very differently, but it seems like more of the rules should be in, the, in common. Um, I do agree with the comment that you made, Mr. Speaker, about we've got to see what these excelling schools are doing right. Absolutely, we can recognize what they're doing right, but a lot of times it feels as if the district schools have their hands tied because the rules are so different. And conversely, it feels as if there aren't rules for the charter schools, particularly um, around procurement issues. So I think that that's something that we should continue to look into so that we can level the playing field across both. Um, kind of hand in hand with that, when charter schools were established, it was not required by state laws for their teachers to have certification, state certification. Some charters required it, but not all did. Now, this last spring, in an effort to address the teacher shortage, the legislature passed a bill that allowed district schools to hire people without certificates. I find that really alarming because my thought is, you know what, instead of lowering the bar, let's raise the bar. And in both situations, raise the bar so everybody's doing the best to impact the students so they can have the best education, regardless of if their parents choose a charter school or a district school. Thank you. And JD, your 30 second response? Sure, 30 seconds, plenty of time. Okay, so uh, number <laughs> one, um, in, and I'll sprinkle my answer throughout other questions as well. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is being reported by the Arizona Republic, which is what, what, you're, what, what it's based on. It is factually, patently uh, incorrect. Uh, the bill that I ran did not remove any existing laws, none whatsoever. We keep asking them for a correction. They keep refusing probably because it doesn't work with their narrative. Uh, but nothing we did relaxed any procurement or conflict of interest law in any statute that exists now. Thank you. Steve, one of our audience members wants to know if the Arizona economy is booming, why are we behind in such areas as education, child poverty, um, and even homelessness? I think that's a great question. Um, Honestly, uh, when, when I take a look at the whole uh, economy, there, there are definitely some winners and there's definitely some losers in that. And I think it has a lot to do with the influence of special interests at, at our state legislature where um, some, some of our lawmakers are more interested in responding to the needs of uh, their special interest counterparts than the actual members of their community. Um, and 
it, it's, it's a great observation. We do have one, 25% basically of our, our kids live in poverty, t poverty these days. And um, I think that's reprehensible, especially in, in an economy that, that should be um, there for everyone. Um, you know, I, I, you know it's, it's hard to tell why it's not trickling down, but I, I again, don't necessarily believe um, in supply side ec economics, which maybe we, we differ on that, but I don't believe that it's actually trickling down to the people th that need it. And um, I think that's, that's a shame because there are some people that are doing very well right now. Um, I think we do need to take a look at the, the current tax structure. I think it's very, it's a regressive tax structure that we have right now. Um, and in that sense, the, the uh, people that are on the lower end of the economic spectrum don't do as well as those on the upper end of the, the spectrum because they're paying more as a percentage of their income than those on the upper. Um, echelon. So um, I think it's something we need to take a look at. I think we, there is some tax reform that is necessary. Thank you. Jennifer? So I would agree with whoever asked the question that it does seem like the economy has recovered, yet specifically when we look at our schools, our schools have not recovered. We're operating with money that is similar to how we funded our schools in 2008, 10 years ago. So that is really alarming. Um, as Steve said, about a quarter of the children living in Chandler are living in poverty, and it is very concerning. Um, I know there are certain areas of the city where we, we can see that we're having issues with homelessness when we've got people on the side of the road who are, are standing with signs by the freeways and so forth. So we definitely do have a lot of those issues happening in our community. Um, I'm very concerned that a large amount of our incoming revenue is being given to businesses, to large corporations, as tax cuts and in loopholes. And I think that that's playing a huge role in why our schools haven't recovered 10 years later. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff? Oh. I'm sorry, J.D. I'm not, Jeff. Sorry about that, J.D. <laughs> I'll take it as a compliment, though. Um, <laughs> so I, um, you know, homelessness is, is something we're always going to be trying to address. And whether the economy is doing well or the economy is doing poorly, there are factors that cause homelessness that go well beyond the economy. It can be anything from mental health uh, to, um, frankly, their immigration status, any number of things. And so um, we're very excited the economy is doing well. Certainly want to uh, work with, um, and a lot of the homelessness issue it does get handled more at the a city level uh, by federal grants. And so the state actually doesn't have a huge role in this, not to say we don't care, but just there's different uh, levels of government that handle different problems. Uh, and so homelessness is not something that we at the state level are, are tasked with, with handling, again, not because we don't care, but because cities tend to be on the forefront of that issue. Um, as far as our schools, that definitely is us. And like I said before, we have put unprecedented, in every sense of the word, unprecedented investment into K-12 education in what we just did this session. Uh, there's no doubt that we're you know, recovering from the 2008, 2009 period of time, which was hardest on Arizona, harder than any other state, even California, on a per capita basis. We were worse hit than every other state. So that's going to be contrib contributing to our, you know, the time it's going to take to get out of that. The good news is we're well positioned today relative to where we were a few years ago. Now I'm going to go back to the charter question because obviously 30 seconds is not enough time to answer. Um, and, and so I, I will just say this. We don't build charter schools. We don't. The state does not. So procurement laws don't apply to them. They apply to district schools because we build district schools. And if we're going to start uh, applying sort of what, what are normally um, limited to state uh, entities to private entities, private run entities, you're going to have a real uh, uh, sort of intermingling of, of different sections of statute. And so it's not going to work if we start imposing those types of things on charter schools. Thank you. And Steve, your 30 second response. Yeah, I would just like to say I find it I find it really interesting that we're we're having this discussion now about about funding our schools, and 
and you know going back in history and looking back at 2009 but the the truth is is that we have not funded our schools for well over the past decade and and I do look to our leaders that that did not step up within that time and and actually favored corporate tax cuts over over our kids and that's that's not me saying this. I mean, you can go back. You can you can look in, at your record. Um, I I think it's pretty simple, um, and it's it's right it's right out there in front of everybody. So um, sorry. Thank you. Oh. And next question, Jennifer, what are your thoughts about uh, community colleges such as Chandler Gilbert? community college being free, and along with that, uh, your thoughts about free tuition being based on income? I think communi community colleges are a great opportunity for students to start their higher ed career, and they're typically less expensive, which is so wonderful because almost anybody can probably afford to go there. I started my career at MCC, and then I went on to university after that. So I think it's a really valuable program. I was stunned in 2015 when the funding to the community colleges was cut to zero. So now the community co colleges are funded with tuition and property taxes. So as far as community college being free, I think it would be wonderful, however, I think that we have a lot of work to do before we have the money at the, at the state level to be able to do that. So I think that that might be a long-term goal. I don't see it happening right away. And then was there another part to the question? Uh, the other part was uh, your thoughts about f uh, free tuition being based on income. That is not something that I've thought of before, so that's something that I would definitely want to research more before I provide an opinion on that one. Thank you. Thank you. JD. Yeah, so um, my students aren't gonna like my answer. Um, I, I teach at Mesa Community College uh, and at ASU as well. Um, I don't think the community college should be free. Uh, if there are financial reasons why someone can't attend, then I would make an exception, so means-based testing to the latter part of the question. I, you know, some sort of means test, I would be okay with that um, because it's an affordability issue. But, but the community college uh, tuition is, is, is quite low, certainly by comparison to the universities. Um, and so it is a great option. And we have some of the best community colleges in the entire country. But I do think there needs to be skin in the game for students. Um, I do notice a difference in the students that I interact with when it's free, and there could be a variety of reasons why it's free, versus when they have to pay a little bit. Um, they take it a little more seriously when there's, when there's a, you know, a little bit of financial investment that they have to, to put forward. So again, if they're financially uh, limited, uh, if they're coming from a, a home situation where they can't afford it truly, then absolutely I think we should find ways to help them. But the idea of across the board free community college, uh, absolutely not. Uh, that would obviously be a burden to all of our taxpayers, and I think the return on investment would be an utter disaster based on my experience teaching just because um, a little bit of, of skin in the game goes a long way for, for students. Thank you. Steve? Yes, I, I actually tend to agree with, with Jennifer. I, I do think that community colleges, um, first of all, they're a great resource within our community. Um, my daughter is a senior at Perry High School right now, and she's considering going to Chandler Gilbert because they have some great programs there. It's much more affordable than, than it would be going to the university. and. I think it's probably a pretty good fit for her. So, um, but that being said, I, I do think that that providing um, free community college is something that would benefit not just kids coming out of high school, but also those that are looking to to change careers, to, to go in a different direction. And um, so, as we're talking about this, 
you know, we may be thinking about just high school kids, but I'm, I'm thinking about those that, that have maybe lost their jobs and need some kind of recertification um, to get back into the workforce. I think, I think that would be um, very beneficial. Um, as far as means-based testing to, to get into community college or to, to pay for community college, um, I'd have to think about that one a little bit. That's, you know, when you're, when you're looking at it is you want it to be on, on the free side. Um, maybe the, the second choice would be to have some kind of means testing. So if you, if you didn't have the funds to attend, um, maybe that would be an, a way to accessing those resources. Thank you. And Jennifer, your 30 second response. Thank you. I disagree that it would be a burden to the taxpayers. And the reason I say that is we're helping people get more education so that they can get jobs, so that they can do better in life, then they can make a positive impact within the community. So I see it as a favorable thing, not a burden to taxpayers. Thank you. And JD, what ideas do you have about holistic tax reform? Oh my goodness, two minutes only, okay. <laughs> Um, so I, there's a lot that we have to do when it comes to tax reform. If for no other reason than we are downstream from the federal tax code and they just reinvented their tax code last December. And so right now um, we have a decision to make and that is to whether we conform to what the federal changes uh, were or, or we don't. We always have in the past because it keeps our tax code simple. But if we conform without any sort of offsetting measure, um, then it will mean a tax increase on our, on our citizens because it will be broadening the tax base, which is what the feds did. They offset their own what would have been a tax increase by then cutting rates. So I would be an advocate for, for doing that. Um, I think there's a lot that we can look at um, in terms of simplifying our tax code. Uh, I, I tend to be uh, on the side of if, you know, having sort of what we call a zero bracket where below this, a poverty level, we don't have an income tax at all, and above that, we have as few of, uh, brackets as possible to keep things simple, not only for taxpayers, but small businesses, because small businesses, most of them, are taxed uh, on the individual income tax side of things. We also have to figure out how to handle the Supreme Court case that just came down, which essentially allows us to tax online retail sales. That has not been a purview of the states previously because of the previous Quill decision by the Supreme Court. They essentially overturned that decision, and so now, you know, as we transition more to online, we're going to have to figure out what is a fair tax policy, uh, so that's going to be a major point of discussion. Um, you also have uh, digital goods um, that we, you know, we moved a bill through the legislature this, or through the House this last session, um, and this has to do with the definition between a digital good and a digital service, which is really hard to define because we, ta we tax goods, sales tax on goods, we don't tax services. So uh, when you get into the cloud and online, it becomes a little more difficult to make a distinction between the two. We have to have a serious conversation about that. Uh, so there's a lot ahead, uh, in my view, on what we have to talk about with tax reform, and I'm looking forward to that conversation. Thank you. Steve? Can you repeat the question one more yes. time? Yes. What ideas do you have about holistic tax reform? So I think I talked about this earlier. Um, I, I do believe that we, we have a very uh, regressive tax system. Um, with those on the lower income um, side of the equation are taxed at a much higher rate as, as a percentage of their income. And, um, you know, Democrats always get tagged for wanting to raise taxes, but I, I really do think that there's, there's a lot of work that we need to do before we ever go down that road. I have said all options need to be on the table as far as, as raising taxes, but I, th I think that we need to look elsewhere first um, when we're talking about um, our corporate tax cuts. Um, right now, we have $4 billion going out the door um, every single every single year, and um, that could be money that could be allocated for our, our public school system. So, um, like I said, everything needs to be on the table at this point so that we can actually make sure that we're funding our, our priorities, um, which to me, again, should be with our, our public schools. Um, right now, they've, they've hemorrhaged, um, and they've, they've been neglected way too long. So I really do believe that um, our tax structure needs to be, to be adjusted to meet those um, demands. Thank you. 
Jennifer? And I would agree with both of the gentlemen that we've got to make some changes. We absolutely do, and I look forward to working on a bipartisan nature, nature on that. Um, we really should be looking at the digital goods and services. I think we need to have more discussion on that because times are changing. So the way we were taxed even 10 years ago might need to be examined. It is very important that we are bringing enough revenue in to pay for basic services like public education. So perhaps we need to look at the corporate taxes like Steve said. So I think that, as you said also, that everything is on the table right now because we are at such a funding crisis. Thank you. Thank you. And JD, your 30-second response? Yeah, so I do want to mention something since we're talking about everything being on the table. Um, and not to bring up a bitter pill to some, but there, but both of you supported Invest in Ed, the, which would have locked our tax rates and brackets in stone. We would have not been able to change them ever. And so there wouldn't have been a broad-based conversation about tax reform if that had gone to the ballot and passed. So it was a, a huge uh, danger, in my opinion, to our ability to manage our tax code. And I was against it from the beginning, and you were support, supportive of it. And I think that's a big difference between the two of us. Thank you. Now, at this time, we will transition to the second part of the debate, where each candidate will receive a separate question with one minute to respond. And additionally, the other candidates will have an optional 30 seconds to address the question. And remember, you can still submit questions via note cards and direct them to specific candidates. The first question is for Jennifer. So Jennifer, how specifically would you work to compromise with a Republican majority? I think that it would depend on the issue because if it's something that is a democratic value like funding our public schools, I'm, I'm going to stick to my guns. However, if there are other issues, I'd be happy to have the conversation with the other side. One thing that has happened to me year after year in my career in education is I've worked with people who I haven't necessarily agreed with, but we need to work on a team together with the goal of educating our students. So if I was serving at the legislature, my goal would to be, be to work with others on the other side of the aisle so that we could reach the goal of not only developing a budget, but doing the best for the people of Arizona. Thank you. And Steve, or J Steve, would you like to chime sure. in for 30 seconds? Please do. Yeah, I, I agree with what Jennifer has to say. I, I, I talk to voters in our district all the time, and you know, I tell them I am running as a Democrat. I do have Democratic values, but I'm here to represent a district. And that means representing people that don't necessarily think the way I do. So the way I approach it is that you know we all have we all have similar shared values, and I try to come at it from that perspective. And um, but again, my my job as a legislator is to represent people of all parties, not just Democrats. Thank you, JD. Did you want to chime in for thirty seconds? Um. Sure. We actually work bipartisanly at the Capitol more than you might think. You just don't hear about it because it's not as exciting as when we're fighting down there. So <laughs> about 80% of the bills we pass are bipartisan or not partisan, just so you know, um, you know, somewhere in that percentage. So we actually get along well, but then sometimes you have to make a decision, got to go left, got to go right, and uh, compromising where we can. Um, but oftentimes the party politics drives each side to the extremes. Thank you. Next question is for Steve. Steve, how would you vote on kids care? Uh, well, kids care uh, is incredibly important. Um, if for those that don't know, that is the um, insurance for children of the working poor. Uh, right now, the federal government funds at, at at 100%, so they'll match it at 100%. Um, but now they're threatening to um, decrease that amount, and state statute says that um, there's an automatic freeze put if the government or the federal government goes below that 100% mark. So um, I would be a, a staunch advocate to remove those restrictions. I think we need to have a statute in place 
for kids care to remain there permanently. Um, I don't think parents should have to be wondering what's gonna happen at the legislature every year before their kids can actually receive care. Um, it's just, it's as simple as that. Thank you. And Jennifer, 30 seconds to chime in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I agree with Steve on that. It's very important that children have access to medical care. As a teacher, I know that my students needed to have immunizations. They needed to have regular doctor visits so that they are healthy and then they can perform well in class. Thank you. And JD, did you want to chime in? Yeah, the only thing I'll add is that the, the tough thing with kids care is not knowing what the feds are going to do because um, they keep saying they're going to extend it or not extend it. And so we did push a bill out of the House. I don't think it made it out of the Senate to give discretion um, as opposed to having an automatic freeze uh, if the feds, you know, defund it or underfund it. But it's, it's challenging for us because we don't know what they're going to do. Thank you. And JD. Can you comment on your work with the Alliance Defending Freedom? Yeah, sure. So mm -hmm. um, I work with essentially a, a, a program that's aimed at helping churches. So, um, and in short, essentially helping churches navigate the, the le legal landscape that's changing out there. And so there's a lot of pastors that, um, you know, they, they have small churches and not a lot of resources to go hire an attorney. And so what, what uh, ADF did, and I was excited to help launch, was this what's called the ADF Church Alliance. And so it essentially unites churches across the country on religious freedom issues. I do consider religious freedom to be a fundamental value of, of our country. And so um, I'm excited to be part of um, helping churches across the country, and um, you know, at least for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Steve, Jennifer, did you want to chime in? On that. Please do. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice already. Um, I, I'm all for religious freedom too. Um, I, I appreciate that sentiment, but I have concerns about your involvement in that um, particular organization because it is designated. The Alliance Defending Freedom is designated as a as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. So I. I and I, I want you to explain um, that involvement in it, but that's that's the um, that's what I've found anyway. Thank you, Jennifer. What is your position on the twenty by twenty twenty plan? We certainly needed a raise for teachers. That was without question, and it it does. It was sad to me that it took over 50,000 teachers coming down to the Capitol to get the attention of the legislature and the governor. Their voices were heard, and I, th I do appreciate that some money was awarded this year. My concern was that the plan was over three years, and the legislature changes every two years. So even though that was great that teachers got some raise this past year, we can't guarantee what's going to happen in 19 or 20 because we will have new people sitting at the legislature. In Chandler, the teachers got about 10% last year, and I believe in Gilbert it was about 9%. So it was a sub substantial raise, and I know teachers really appreciated that, but it's not enough yet. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, JD, did either of you want to chime in? I, I want to chime in on the last thing, uh, obviously. <laughs> so am I allowed to do that? Based on her answer, yes. No, based on his. Oh, his Okay. Attacking me, I, I would love to respond. You've got thirty seconds to chime okay. in. Um, so the Southern Poverty Law Center is a radical, progressive, left-wing organization that's labeling evangelical Christianity as hate. You can look at their you can look at their list of who they put on the hate list. Um, but traditional Christian values are now being labeled by hate by them. And you can l read the Wall Street Journal and other publications that are calling them out on this because you cannot consider evangelical Christians like neo-Nazis. Neo-Nazis are a hate group. Evangelical Christians are not. Thank you. Steve, someone is asking uh, how about your getting into politics. Can you please elaborate um, your decision to get into politics uh, for your daughters? Yeah, um, 
So my mom was a, a kindergarten teacher for 38 years, mm -hmm. and um, um, basically public education is, has always been drilled into me. It's, it's the cornerstone of our democracy. And so when I saw my own daughters that, you know, their, their teachers didn't have the resources that they needed, um, and, you know, that by, by extension, our, our kids didn't have that. So um, it just made me want to get involved. And uh, a Democrat happened to knock on my door one day and ask if, if I wanted to come to a meeting. And at that point, I just decided that I, w I would, you know, follow my heart. And long story short, uh, I've been involved for about 10 years, and it's really been to support our teachers and to support our students. That's where I'm at. Thank you. Jennifer, JD. Great. All right. JD. Uh, someone's asking, why have, what is your position about budget talks excluding the Democratic representatives until the last minute and, um, and uh, voting going in late into the evening? Oh. Okay, uh, well, we didn't exclude the Democrats. It was just very clear where their position was. And you can actually ask them, especially even in the first year we did the budget. I, I brought the Democrats into my conference room. I think it was one of the first times that had ever happened to go through and compare uh, budgets, if you will. Um, as far as the um, going into the night, I mean, we were working around the clock to try to get uh, the budget passed because that was the criteria we were told. Uh, for teachers to get back into the classroom because we were on day eight, I think, of the strike um, when it finally came to an end. So yeah, we were working around the clock. Um, and that's pretty typical for a budget. Uh, budgets uh, take hours and hours of debate and you generally don't stop. As soon as you introduce, you, you press forward. Um, if you start at eight in the morning, people have lots of energy through the day. So you end up in the middle of the night, you start later, you still up, end up in the middle of the night, seems inevitable. But in this particular case, it was because we wanted to get it done so we could get teachers back in the classroom. Thank you. Steve, Jennifer, Jennifer, please, 30 seconds. One thing that I would like to say, I really appreciate the way that you set up the subcommittees within the house. I thought that that was a really great idea, so I do appreciate that. I also don't know if it's a possibility, but it would be really great if when, when we start budget talks, if, if there's a stop time like 10 and then you start again the next morning, just because I know that myself, I do much better when I've had sleep and when the legislators are doing something that's so important for our state, I worry that they've had so little sleep, maybe they've been up 24 hours sometimes. Thank you. Steve? Yeah. I. I you know, I, I want to echo Jennifer's sentiments only for the fact that, that I found myself nodding off at 4.30 in the morning trying to follow <laughs> the legislative uh, procedures so, and debate. Um, but, but I really do feel that, you know, the people's business should be done in some kind of wakeful hours. Um, it, it's, you know, a lot of things can be done in, in, the, in the dark of night when people aren't paying attention. And, and that could be on both sides. I'm, I'm not saying that it's uh, one particular side. So. Thank you. Jennifer, what do you think of the current sex education legislation in the state? And if you don't think highly of it, how would you suggest it be improved? It's scripted right now, and I understand why it's scripted. Um, one challenge with it, I think, is that in elementary school, I can speak as an elementary school teacher, um, we're, we're given the script. And what I saw at my school is some people were very uncomfortable. So we had one male teacher, and whether he wanted to or not, he had to teach the boys, and he was supposed to stay to the script. And then we would divide, and one of our female teachers, she's actually here in the audience, she would teach the girls, and then the other teacher and I would cover the PE classes. So I think that the way that we're doing it is not the best. I think it would be very interesting if a group, an outside group, could provide medically accurate information to the students, and then it wouldn't be putting a fifth or a sixth grade teacher who went to school and learned pedagogy and teaching young children, it wouldn't put them in an uncomfortable spot if they weren't comfortable discussing that with students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Steve, JD? All right. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Steve, what are your thoughts about Chandler PD being able to work with federal agencies? <clears throat> That's a very good question. Um, and it, and I, I guess I would have to know the context. Um, my degree is actually in criminal justice, and, and I do think there has to be a good relationship between between your local, your state, your federal um, law enforcement agencies, especially as far as communication goes, especially in times where, um, where you know there's some kind of natural disaster or or some kind of emergency. So as far as working together, I would say that's a actually a really good thing. Um, but I, I maybe the context of that question was something else. But that's that's what I would say. Thank you. Jennifer, JD? Well, I, I, I would bring up one context, and that is that there was a survey out there where specifically both of you were asked whether or not uh, law enforcement should be prohibited from working with ICE, and you both said yes, they should be prohibited from working with ICE, which I strongly disagree with. Thank you. Jennifer? 30 seconds. And I would, I would echo what Steve was saying, that it's important that different layers of the government are working together. But at the same time, I think that it's really important that, um, mm, I lost my train of, that, of thought. I'll leave it at that, that, that I think that we need to make sure that we have good relationships between different levels of government. Thank you. JD, can you please explain how you differ from your opponents in terms of, um, from your opponent in terms of being an education champion? Someone yeah. received a piece of literature that stated that you are an education champion. Please yeah. elaborate. So, um, well, I guess I'll start with uh, what I know to be the case, and that is I ran the bill uh, for the 20% by 2020, restoring classroom supply funding and all of that. Proud to do it. It was uh, five times the Democratic proposal from the previous year, and yet they still were opposed to the bill. Um, I believe Mr. Wickard is, is, was against the proposal from the perspective of it doesn't go far enough, which is something we hear very common. But think about it. You're voting against a 20% pay raise because it doesn't go far enough. And it was a bipartisan bill. There were others who felt that it, it did. So fundamentally, I was proud to run the bill that was the largest investment in K-12 in state history. I stand behind it. I'm going to campaign on it. Thank you. Steve, Jennifer? Yeah, I'd love to respond. 30 seconds. Go ahead. Um, so like I've, I said before, you know, I got involved in this, this, this political world for, you know, a decade ago. And I would just like to know where were you five years ago, six years ago, because I actually watched those debates, those budget debates, and, and JD, your record doesn't support the fact that you are an education champion. And, and frankly, it, it, it irritates me, especially as somebody that's been fighting for so long. And, and to hear you say that now in an election year, it doesn't ring true to me, so. Thank you. Jennifer? And as far as education champion, I don't have a mailer, but I have worked in the schools for 17 years. And then in 2016, I was the co-chair of the CUSD override committee that was successfully voted in. Thank you. Thank you. And Jennifer, what is your experience with policy writing and analysis? I don't have experience with policy writing. However, I'm a really good student, I'm a quick learner, and I know that I will have other legislators at the House who will take me under their wing and show me what I need to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Steve, yeah, JD? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, Go ahead. Policy-wise, I'm, I'm a hospital administrator, so I, I deal in policy, uh, well, on a daily basis in that job. Um, you have to follow policy to make sure that people are, are you know, safe and, and in a secure environment. So I've done a lot of policy work. Um, as far as an analysis, I've been, I've been a data analyst for about 20 years. So that's also part of the job that I've been doing. So um, uh, that's something that's very familiar to me and I'm hoping to take those skills to the legislature. Thank you. 
JD? Uh, 16 years of policy uh, writing, advising. I spent eight years um, as a policy advisor before I ran for the House, and now I've been in the House for eight years, so 16 years. Thank you. Steve, with the division between the Republicans and the Democrats uh, being ex extremely sharp, uh, what is your plan to bring these two sides together? That's a, I think that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, you know, JD and I obviously have some, some differences. Um, but that being said, it's, it's what I talked about before. It's, it's about developing relationships. And um, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that, that have had the, the pleasure, actually, of working with people that I don't necessarily agree with. And um, it forces you to take a look at, at problems from an entirely new perspective. And um, rather than look at it as a negative, I, I always do look at it as a positive. And, and I'll tell you, there, there have been some things that have happened at the legislature um, where the Republicans have stood up for an idea that I at first was adamantly opposed to. And as I started getting more information, I was, I was able to kind of see their point of view as well. So um, I think it's just a matter of, of listening. Um, that's my job as, as, a, as a prospective legislator. It's really about listening to, to the public. Thank you. JD, Jennifer? And I would agree seconds. that it's about building relationships with people. You need to listen to what they're saying, and you need to build relationships so they listen when you, when you speak. And just because somebody has a different political party than you, it does not mean that they're wrong. They have great ideas, too, and we do need to come to the middle because we're far too divided. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'd, I'd like to think, unless someone uh, at the House will contradict this, but that I, I treated folks on the other side of the aisle with the utmost respect, um, including them in meetings. They hadn't been included in them before. Obviously, we would disagree on things, but kept the channels open, um, solicited their feedback, deferred to them where I could. Uh, and I, I, they said nice things to me at the end of the session about it publicly, so you can see the, that I'm not just making this up. But I feel, I feel very strongly that at the very least, you can have respectful relationships with those on the other side of the aisle. Thank you. And JD, uh, here's an opportunity to maybe elaborate. Uh, one of our audience members um, states that you were quoted as saying, Trans quote, transparency is not the overarching principle in elections. So can you please explain what is? Oh, I'm very grateful for that question. So that's half my quote. The first half says transparency is a good thing. Uh, what I did say is that you don't sacrifice everything. And so it's thus not the overarching principle. So, and it wasn't talking about elections, by the way. It was talking about um, whether or not people have the right to contribute without fear. In other words, maintain their privacy and who they contribute to. Uh, not to candidates. Candidates have to disclose everything, but whether or not another entity has First Amendment uh, rights and privacy rights uh, with exercise. Just like you have the right to privacy when you vote. We would never, ever question that. I do think there's something to be said for um, somebody's right to privacy for fear of retribution from the government or those that are in power. So what I, what I said was transparency is no doubt a good thing, but it is not the overarching thing. And I go on to talk about the importance of privacy and your First Amendment rights. Thank you. Steve, Jennifer? I would just like to say, you know, we had a, a ballot initiative out there, the Outlaw Journey Money um, initiative, and, and I was highly supportive of that. Um, I do believe that that individuals should have to disclose who, who they're giving to, and PAC should have to disclose who they're giving to, because at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot of individuals that are comprising a larger group that's trying to influence um, politicians. Um, you know, I, I well, stop. <laughs> Thank you. Jennifer? And to build on what Steve said, I think that you mean outlaw dirty money. Yes. What did I say? Invest in ed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so yes, what outlaw he was saying, money. but outlaw dirty money instead of invest in ed. Thank you. Thank you. You always have my back. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer? What are your thoughts on the extension of high-speed mass transit into Chandler, whatever form that may take? 
I think it's a great idea. However, with, with the money that we have to work with, again, I don't see it happening anytime soon, but I think it would be a, a really wonderful thing. My husband works in Phoenix, and he's got a long commute. My daughter goes to ASU downtown. It's a long commute, so anything that would speed that up I think would be great. But the money to build the infrastructure, I'm not sure that we've got that. Thank you. Steve, JD? Okay. So, Steve, what is your position on the Independent Redistric Redistricting Commission? I, I'm all for and it. Why, why not? <clears throat> right, I am all for it. Um, I do believe that um, we are one of the, the pioneers in this in um, the United States to actually stop the gerrymandering of districts and to actually promote fairness within, within our elections and drawing of maps. Um, so I, I do believe that, uh, that it's a good thing. Uh, what I don't agree with is there was some action in the legislature um, in this, I believe it was past session, where we were trying to add more members to the um, Independent Redistricting Commission to make it an even number. And um, that, that even number would have resulted in a tie, which would have been broken by, by the legislature. And I, I really do feel that's a power grab from the legislature again, and, and I'm uh, against that. Thank you. Jennifer, JD? And I would agree with what Steve's saying, that the um, independent redistricting committee that we have now is a model across the country. And I think that we should keep it in play as it is without making adjustments. I worry that if it was made a body that was even politically, then we would have ties. And then, then that would be broken by, I believe, the governor. And I think when we're making decisions like that, we always have to consider if the tables were turned and the majority party was opposite of what it is now, would that be fair? So we've got to keep that in mind. Thank you. JD? Uh, so two things. Um, I, I don't think an even number is a good idea, but I do think it needs to have more people. Right now you have one person that's the independent. All the power is concentrated in that person. If you look next door in California, I think they have 14 people, and they require a cross-section of agreement, which we don't require. So I do think we can we can glean some from what they do there in terms of trying to make it a little more balanced. And we, we have to not allow them to overpopulate districts for the sake of partisanship, which is what they did. The vast majority of Republican districts are overpopulated and Democratic districts underpopulated, which seems like gerrymandering to me. Thank you. JD. Despite uh, opposition from the then Arizona Supreme Court, you sponsored and passed legislation increasing the number of AZ Supreme Court justices. So in a time when other departments and agencies are experiencing cost reduction and efficiency standards, um, why increase the size of the Supreme Court? Yes, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. So mo most states our size, our population, were at seven or beyond. We were at five. We had an increased, uh, we had increased from three to five back in like 1960 or something like that. So it had been at five. Most states were at seven. I'm a big believer in, in not concentrating power in the hands of fewer folks, which again, again with the clean election, uh, with the uh, IRC, the Independent Redistricting Commission, or the Supreme Court, I think there should be more people so that you're spreading power out among more people. That's why I, I uh, uh, sponsored the additional two uh, members of the Supreme Court. Thank you. Steve, Jennifer? I just, I'd like to say, okay. you know, I, I, I think it's a problem when you have five justices that are telling you that they, their workload is fine, they can handle what was coming their way, and we still added two justices. And to me, that speaks to another motive. Maybe you can explain that, but um, I, I really think that, that we, we had it under control in the first place. So, and when it ended up happening, that Invest in Ed initiative got kicked off the ballot based on those two extra justices that were added. Thank you. Jennifer? No, nothing? All right, Jennifer, what are your thoughts on our legislators in initiating and voting on legislature that benefits their bottom line? I'm opposed to that. Um, I, I've done a lot of reading where um, there is a discussion about um, 
conflict of interest. And from what I'm understanding, if, if it impacts 10 or more, then it's considered conflict of interest. And if it's fewer than that, do I have it opposite? The, the opposite. But it seems like if you personally are going to be making money from your vote, that you should have to abstain. Thank you. You're welcome. JD? Yeah. Steve? Go ahead. So I'll just add that mm -hmm. the, the challenge is you have to come up with a number. I totally agree. We need to make sure people are not potting, patting their pockets and impacting their bottom line. If we were to vote on a tax cut that impacted everybody, we would all be disqualified, right, because it impacts us. So you have to have some sort of bar, and the rule of 10 is, is the bar. And if it needs to be higher, I'm, I'm open to that conversation. No other state, by the way, has an even, even a specific number. We're the only one that actually put a number out there. But if we want to entertain a higher number, that, I'm certainly open to that conversation. Thank you. Steve, no? Okay. Steve, do you think that the minimum wage is sufficient to support living standards here in Arizona? Why, why not? Uh, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, were, there was a lot of uh, discussion at the Capitol and the Chamber of Commerce that basically that the sky was going to fall because we were raising the minimum wage. We didn't see that. So there was a, there was a, lot, of, uh, a lot of commotion around that. Um, and by the way, if we're saying that we have a really strong economy right now, that's all part of it. And recognizing the fact that we will be increasing it still, um, you know, that remains to be seen. But it seems like we've done pretty well raising that that minimum wage. And I do believe that that people should have a living wage. Um, they they should be able to live and work in in the um, in their community that they live in. So um, I'm all for that. Thank you. JD, Jennifer? And I would agree that people need to have a living wage to live in their community. I know that the cost of housing here in Chandler is really expensive. One of our staff people looked at getting an apartment, and even with what we pay, which is above minimum wage, he couldn't find a place to rent in Chandler. He was outpriced. So he's working in Chandler and living in Tempe. Thank you. JD? So the minimum wage increase did have pretty significant impact on the DD community and pro service providers trying to provide services to the DD community. Um, and we're still trying to figure out the impact to them so we can add additional resources. And we heard from school districts who had to reallocate money that would have gone to teachers, that would have gone into the classroom to meet uh, the, the increase. And so it's, uh, you know, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, it, I don't think we should be saying that it had no negative impact. It did cause a redirection of resources that could have gone to critical areas to go elsewhere. Thank you. JD, why, explain why um, charter schools uh, don't have to be audited each year, just like businesses or pay income taxes. So uh, charter schools do get audited, um, and the State Board for Charter Schools oversees the auditing. You can go to their website okay. and check out uh, check it out. Um, again, I, I keep coming back to. Um, if we're going to go down the road of turning charters into districts, then we need to ask why. What is it that we're accomplishing? I want to maintain our focus on outcomes. If they're performing, that's what we are contracting with them to do. Um, again, as with any contracting entity, whether it's education, healthcare, infrastructure, or, or whatever. Um, so I'm going to, you know, maintain focus on, on outcomes. But just for what it's worth, they do get audited. Um, and even the, the uh, Auditor General does audit some uh, uh, charter schools, but most are audited by, or uh, hire an auditor, and it's submitted to the State Board for Charter Schools. So there is a mechanism there. Thank you. Steve, Jennifer? And I'm really concerned when we've seen in the past year charter schools that have folded due to financial reasons. If there was auditing done and that was made available to the public, I'm not sure that that would have happened. And then we, we have the fact that the buildings belong to the charter school owner. So once the, uh, the school closes, the owner still owns the buildings. And I find that problematic. Steve? Yeah, I, I would say 
if if we are auditing, then I'm not sure that we're doing a very good job. I, you know, look at the CEO of Primavera Online Schools. They have one of the worst um, graduation rates, um, worst outcomes that we've seen, yet the CEO is making $8.8 .8 million a year, and they put, what is it, $36 million into an investment portfolio that should have been destined for, for the children that they're, they're supposedly serving. So um, I think we have some issues there. Thank you. And at this time, we are going to go to our closing statements, and the first closing statement will be given by Jennifer. Thank you. This is one minute, is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Correct. I really appreciate that the Clean Elections Commission has hosted the debate tonight, and I appreciate that all of you have taken time out of your schedules to be here. I would like to remind you that if you are agreeing with a lot of what I've said tonight, that when it comes time to vote, there are two House seats, and I would invite you to use one of your votes for me. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank, again, all of you for, for coming out on, on a Tuesday evening and hearing us drone on about things. Um, but they're very important things, and I, I'm so glad that you took the time to actually want to know um, who is potentially going to be representing you. Um, I, I just think it, this this forum is is amazing, and, and I want to thank JD for, for coming out. Um, you know, there's been some time where we haven't seen representatives from the other side, and I really do think it's important that our our voters get to hear both sides of the issues. And, and JD and I have some stark differences, and um, and I hope that that you evaluate those. And whether you're a Democrat, Independent, or Republican, um, my goal is to be a public servant. I, I've I've said that from the start. Um, you know, I'm, I have, I'm leaving a, a very good paying job for one that doesn't pay so well, and it's because I want to represent you. So thank, thank you so much, and I, I hope I can get your vote. Thank you. And JD. Thank you. Um, well, it was a pleasure uh, being here alongside my colleagues up here. I was not droning on. I don't know what you were talking about, but um, <laughs> I do appreciate you coming. You know, a lot of people focus on the federal elections, and obviously what happens in Congress is a big deal. But, but really, the, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, who you elect to the legislature uh, probably impacts your life even more. Uh, so I appreciate you being here. appreciate the opportunity to make my case. I've been in the House for eight years. Um, and you can say you agree or disagree with certain things that I did, but I, as, as your representative, did some of the biggest things we've ever done. Uh, and, and the most recent example, and it's just one example, of course, uh, is, the, is the education investment this year. I also, as Speaker of the House, weathered some pretty challenging stuff that was unique to the House, even going so far as to have a member expelled for the first time in 70 years. That was not easy. But in my view, that's what was required, and that's what leadership is. So I've tried to demonstrate uh, over the last eight years my commitment to you. Um, I'm hoping that you'll give me the honor of your vote for the State Senate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Candidates, thank you so much for participating in our forum here tonight. And to our audience members, thank all of you so much for coming out tonight to educate yourselves before voting. And we strongly encourage you to visit www.azcleanelections.gov forward slash voter dashboard. It'll provide you with a more customized experience to find information on the general election, the candidates, the issues, and to be able to view this debate on demand. And we ask that you please fill out the evaluation form that was given to you when you came in and return it to one of our volunteers. This uh, feedback is very important to the commission and it will help to improve future debates. And we thank you all for coming tonight. And you're welcome to stay and speak directly to the candidates. Have a good evening.